Welcome everybody to this week's uh, session, kickoff uh, for the new academic year for our happy hour session. Um, because we've got some new uh, first year residents starting out, um, I had asked one of my uh, good friends uh, and colleagues, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from the military, Dr. Justin Bendino, to um, uh, provide us an introductory to dermatopathology uh, lecture. And that's what we'll be having today. Um, always a good idea, I think, at the start of the, the academic year to, to have a, a good kind of uh, mountaintop experience of, of where you're going to be headed. And always good to review these things. Uh, as is always the case, uh, if you have any questions uh, at all during the session, you can um, uh, contact us at education at sagesdx.com or you can email me directly, uh, tdavis at sagesdx.com. Uh, my phone number is 210-416-4815. And so I never mind anybody contacting me directly via phone. And uh, so that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Bandino. Justin. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Davis, for that introduction, um, Dr. Bandino. And I'm going to jump right into this introduction of Derm Path, uh, which is really a broad overview, kind of more the forest view. I'm going to share my uh, slides here. All right. So, uh, again, this is a very broad overview. It covers a lot of different things. Um, you know, I want to briefly mention the why. Why do we really uh, dive this much into a, a pathological subspecialty? Um, what are the different, uh, you know, categories, you know, of just how even, again, forced you to, to approach dermatopathology, different study techniques, some of the textbooks, um, and then also, uh, you know, really spend some time on tissue processing. That's a lot of, of this presentation, just to have at least one time in residency or, or during the study of dermatopathology to, to understand some of the basics of what happens um, that, that people in the pathology world are very comfortable with, but oftentimes in the dermatology world, uh, we're not as comfortable with. And then uh, just, you know, kind of throw up some basics for microscope and then uh, some comparison of a typical pathological evaluation versus MOS, and then uh, uh, mention the guidelines. So let's dive into this. So, you know, again, why? Why do we spend so much time uh, studying and investing um, into dermatopathology? Well, you know, honestly, for, for many residents these days, which is totally understandable, uh, it's because you have tests, right? You have exams, you have uh, this new board exam of the future, which is now finally kind of in its, in its uh, fruition in terms of um, every class in dermatology residency now will be going through this, um, this new model going forward. And uh, we just had our most recent graduates that have done that now all three years, you know, kind of the, the new method. So you have the basic exam, uh, end of your first year, you've got these four core exams you have to take. Then you have the applied exam, which is kind of like the old board exam. And there's dermatopathology on all these tests. So for that reason alone, certainly you need to understand dermatopathology, and that's why we study it during residency. And just very briefly on this, you'll get more information, um, you know, throughout residency on these exams. But uh, this is a graphic that the American Board of Dermatology put together, and um, no one here began dermatology training prior to 2018, uh, well, except for myself. Um, and so uh, you know, anyone who's kind of currently in residency really uh, fits into the second category. So you can see there again, these different um, timelines uh, uh, that you're taking, the base exam, core exam, applied exam. And there's, there's four modules total. And one of those is a dermatopathology core exam. And so you need to study for that. And it's the entire exam uh, taken out of Proctor's uh, uh, setting is uh, all dermatopathology. Um, and by the way, if you're not aware, it would be good at, uh, at some point during residency, ideally maybe the, you know, initially early on first year, really dive into the American Board of Dermatology um, website because there's a lot of good material on there um, to include you know, just some overviews and, and, uh, and even study guides and things like that. They're pretty broad, but they're still helpful. 
Uh, this is one that they created that's for dermatopathology, just, just to give you a, a rough idea of what you'd expect on the basic versus the core exam versus the applied exam. And again, there's dermatopathology and all these things. Uh, here's some examples of content. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but again, this stuff is out there uh, and it's good to be aware of what you're going to be tested on. Um, this is uh, on the core specifically, so the core dermatopathology module. Um, there's a lot of stuff on here to include recognizing uh, special stains and, you know, immunohistochemical stains and even lab techniques. So some of those things uh, you'll need to be studying and, and focusing on uh, during your residency and, and certainly before this test. Okay, so, um, and, and by the way, there's even um, some sample virtual Dern path items because really everything is virtual now. That's a whole separate discussion, but, you know, much of uh, what we're um, going to be changing residencies toward is a very virtual curriculum. And so uh, there's even some virtual study sets out there. And I'll kind of mention some of this as well. So some additional items to study. So that's one big why, right? That's why we dive into this is because you're going to be tested on it. But then actually what really is technically more important, um, there's clinical pathologic correlation. Uh, so the, the more you understand of what you see under the microscope, what's happening pathologically, um, the better you are as a dermatologist. And, and you know, certainly I do want to mention also, you know, a lot of this, this lecture is geared towards the dermatology resident, but still a lot of a crossover and application to a pathology uh, uh, resident. Um, in terms of understanding the clinical aspects um, of some of the pathological things that a, a pathology a resident might be uh, looking at. So, so having that crossover is critical for both fields, really, um, and then certainly during derm residency to, to really invest in, in the pathological um, side of the house. You can understand what's going on clinically and, and better um, uh, make a treatment plan for your patient. And then believe it or not, you know, you can still read your own slides. So I think nowadays some residents in dermatology, dermatology are coming into residency and maybe not even aware of this, but you, know, you can still read your own slides in this day and age. That may change at one point, but um, you know, especially if it's more basic things, um, that's of course depends on whether you want to or not and, and whether you feel competent after residency to do so. But the, the point of, you know, during residency, the goal is to have you leave residency with the ability to do so, at least basic reading um, and basic dermatopathology. And so that's important to understand that as well. All right, so now let's just talk about dermatopathology in general. And again, this is kind of geared towards dermatology residents. And, and so really I would pose, you know, are they really drastically different? Uh, when, you, when you're studying for dermatology versus studying for dermatopathology, certainly one is all at a microscope, you're not moving much, you're not really talking to anybody, um, you know, hopefully not, you're talking to your slides. Um, but, uh, but, but in terms of studying the content, you're still focusing on morphology. Uh, again, whether it's a clinic patient is, um, you know, you're looking at distribution, morphology, the, the, the texture, the patterns, you know, it's a lot of pattern recognition. Um, in, in a clinic patient, it might be you know, are, are, is it local? Is it diffuse? Is it acral? You know, what's the distribution? Uh, is it psoriasiform? Is it lichenoid? Is it eczematous? And you're, you're trying to fit into these different patterns. And those are, you can use those terms clinically. But again, you can use some of those terms uh, pathologically as well. And that's kind of the point and, and one of the ways to approach dramatic pathology is you're trying to create these buckets. You know, what does something psoriasiform look like under the microscope? And what differential um, diagnosis tree, does that maybe take you down? Same thing, eczematous and spongiotic and, and uh, you know, a lot of different um, morphological approaches and, and pattern recognition and attention to detail. So a lot of similarities, similarities there, I think. And so I would encourage you <clears throat> throughout residency and throughout studying dermatopathology, uh, you know, you really take some steps back, especially very early on, because you can get very much overwhelmed in terms of the content and just early on, there's just all these colors everywhere and it's a mess of inflammatory cells and trying to figure out even what those inflammatory cells. And one of the things I sometimes tell my residents, you know, do you think it's an OMA or an itis? And just start there. I mean, really, so, and sometimes it can be hard to tell, uh, especially if it's like a lymphoma or something, but you know, that sometimes is a very good early way to approach something. And if you get into that broad bucket, one of those buckets, then kind of go from there. But just like anything else in medicine, um, when you're looking at skin under the microscope, you can still approach it very 
um, you know, in, in these broad categories, right? Is it, do you think it's something neoplastic? Is it inflammatory? Um, it, or is it infectious or, you know, a grab bag of just random miscellaneous things? So in those categories, you then dive deeper. And once you're, you're hopefully get into the right bucket that, oh, this is an OMA, for example, some sort of neoplasm. Well, then is it an epidermal neoplasm? Is it, you know, meaning of course the epidermis or, you know, you, know, you can also kind of include the dermis there, but, but particularly the, the epithelial layer, you know, the, the epidermis. Is it an adnexal tumor, um, melanocytic, soft tissue, lymphoproliferative, or some sort of cutaneous metastasis? And I kind of split these out a little bit too, not to, you know, really dive too deep because that's what the rest of residency is for. But um, in terms of epidermal, again, is it is it something that's benign or malignant, right? So then you even go a little bit further. So is it seborrheic keratosis, or a cyst, or is it maybe some sort of um, keratinocytic carcinoma? Um, adnexal structures implies um, pretty much all the other structures and things and glands and whatnot in the skin. Uh, so you're talking about eccrine glands and uh, apocrine glands and things like that, spacious glands, or even just the pilar unit, right? So the follicular unit. So, so when a tumor arises from one of those parts, which can be a, a ton of different adnexal tumors that can arise, um, then it, it might, that might be one thing to consider on your differential. Melanocytic, of course, and then again, is it benign, more of a nevus or melanoma, which by the way, nevus just means hamartomatous growth. And so technically the most specific thing is to say melanocytic nevus, because there's actually a lot of different nevi or hamartomatous things. And the word nevus is used in a, in a variety of dermatological things. So a melanocytic nevus is, of course, your traditional mole that we think of. Um, then there's soft tissue tumors, and that's a whole you know, deep category that's challenging even for, for many uh, board certified dermatic pathologists. Um, it, there's all the different sections within soft tissue tumor, um, and there's soft tissue specialists out there. And then there's lymphoproliferative. Uh, so a lot of different lymphomas um, and dyscrasias and things that, uh, that all of this we can see on the microscope and all of this is in the neoplasm world. So again, the point here is to sort of just provide the forest view, maybe get down a little bit and just some, some uh, overview of some of the content that's in each of these big buckets. And then the rest of residency is, is kind of diving into these so that you can then start to recognize these under the microscope. In terms of the inflammatory world, we talk about things that are spongiotic. Many of those are eczematous in appearance clinically. Um, and spongiotic just means lots of kind of bubbliness and edema and, and um, uh, vesiculation, potentially all this thing, you know, a, a certain pattern of inflammation that you'll see under the microscope. There's interface damage. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of break these apart, but psoriasis form, uh, blistering, granulomatous, uh, vasculitis, or the vasculitity, that's all included in inflammatory paniculitis as well. Um, so again, just to spread these out a little bit, when, when you go to interface, what that means is there's some sort of inflammation that's happening at the dermal epidermal junction. And you can have vacuolar interface, which you'll you know, again learn more in detail down the road, uh, where you're just kind of seeing this little vacuolization of that dermal epidermal junction, but maybe not necessarily a ton of inflammatory cells versus something that is truly lichenoid, where you're seeing a dense lichenoid band of inflammation um, that often then has uh, you know, a, a pretty uh, significant interface damage that's occurring. But these are some different terms that we'll clarify more down the road um, that, that uh, you need to be familiar with. So what does interface mean, vacuole interface, lichenoid interface? There's psoriasiform um, conditions. And again, these are all different patterns. So this is different inflammatory patterns that you will be able to look at on a microscope and say, oh, this looks psoriasiform. And then what does that mean in terms of the differential? Or then maybe you drill down and see, you know, are there newts in the horn or, or is there uh, busy dermis uh, and lichenoid going on? Is this syphilis? I mean, there's, there's other things that you'll assess uh, to try to uh, really uh, get to the most likely diagnosis. Blistering conditions, that's, uh, you know, immunobolus things, bolus pemphigoid, uh, also includes the acantholytic disorders. Um, there's a, a, a variety of different granulomatous inflammatory conditions. And then again, that source further splits off into whether it's tuberculoid pattern, a palisading granuloma pattern, separative granulomas or sarcoidal granulomas. Again, we'll learn more about that later, but just different types of granulomatous inflammation that each has its own differential uh, diagnosis. The vasculitides and then uh, paniculitis, 
and when it comes to vasculitis, you know, you, you were, we're typically trying to say, is this a large vessel, vasculitis, a medium vessel, uh, a small vessel, or, or something small and medium vessel. Um, and so then that further helps you on your differential diagnosis. Uh, and then again, the, the paniculitides, um, broad, just thinking broadly, we, we like to say, is it a lobular paniculitis or is it a septal paniculitis? So inflammatory conditions, I'll just pause here briefly, can be very challenging. And there's a lot of depth here. Again, we're just trying to provide a, 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 an overview of all these things uh, in this lecture. Now, anything infectious, lots of infectious things can affect the skin. Um, so bacterial, fungal, viral, spirochete, uh, protozoan, worms, I mean, just it, the list goes on and on. Um, a lot of cool things actually that you can see in the skin. And I'm not gonna go into any more detail there. And then in the world of dramatic pathology, just like dermatology, there's a whole grab bag of miscellaneous things, uh, disorders of collagen and elastin, um, eucinoses, depositional disorders, um, uh, to include just different things that can be de deposited in the skin, not necessarily the genetic depositional um, disorders or like metabolic storage diseases that we learned about. Um, drug reactions, uh, you know, both uh, topical and systemic. Uh, and then there's a variety of genodermatoses, these kind of genetic or congenital conditions that many of them can have very unique, interesting skin findings and even um, dramatic uh, histopathological findings. And then there's uh, the kind of external causes, agents, artifacts, fillers, um, other you know things that, that you might see in the skin that don't don't come from the skin. Um, and all these can be diagnosed and need to be diagnosed by um, a dermatopathologist and studied by dermatologists and, and uh, dermatology and pathology residents. So speaking of studying, how in the world does one approach all of those things? I mean, that's really just the iceberg. Those are just like the, the chapter uh, titles, right? Of, of all the things that need to be studied, um, you know, for, uh, you know, focusing on dramatic pathology. And so these are just some basic tips. Everyone has to kind of uh, figure out for, the, for themselves, you know, what's the best way to study but I did throw together some tried and true methods, both for when I was a resident and then um, what, what uh, worked for many of my residents. So certainly the textbooks. Uh, there's a couple core textbooks that most programs will use um, for dramatopathology. And then there's some more detailed ones that often are more dramatopathology fellowship level. So I'll kind of mention these. Uh, many of these textbooks have online content. Um, the, the book that, that, that we mostly use at uh, the Sauschek Durham Residency uh, Military Program, mostly use the Elston um, uh, textbook because uh, it's fairly comprehensive, not too much, not too little. And then also when you buy the book, you get this online content to these Elston PowerPoints because a long time ago they were literally just PowerPoints that where he was dictating. But um, now they're online content, you click on them and he updates these and he's basically kind of walking you through and teaching you, you know, the content from each chapter. So they, they can be very helpful. Um, this is uh, the third edition, um, probably due to be updated soon. Um, and then there's Dr. Elston himself. And then just, just a screenshot here of those PowerPoints I mentioned. You can see there's one for every chapter um, in his book. And uh, I found these to be very helpful when I was a resident because I would kind of listen to these and go through these. So that's one textbook that uh, is kind of, I would consider a core Durham Path textbook and comes with his online content. Uh, another core textbook would be the Rapini textbook, just updated, just came out, I think in March. Um, and so this is another excellent uh, dermatopathology textbook because it's, it's comprehensive enough, uh, but it doesn't necessarily get crazy in the weeds, um, just same thing with Elson's book, they're, they're, they're really geared at a dermatology resident or a pathology resident even who's studying dermatopathology without trying to get, you know, way over detailed like you might need to be as, as a fellow in a fellowship. Uh, Dr. Rapini is out in Houston and an excellent textbook as well. And then there's other textbooks. So these ones are in many cases a little bit more detailed. So Whedon Skin Pathology, um, there's a relatively new edition there. Uh, McKee, uh, you know, out of um, Great Britain, although now it's written by Dr. Cal uh, Caloni, uh, Pathology of the Skin. Uh, and there's others as well. There's plenty of, of dermatopathology textbooks out there. These ones in particular tend to be very detailed. McKee's Pathology of Skin actually has a lot of clinical in it. And originally it was kind of geared more towards pathologists to really kind of provide a lot of that extra, you know, codochromes or pictures and, and, and clinical stuff 
uh, that can be very handy, but, but I think great for dermatologists as well to kind of pair that up together with the histopathology. So certainly, you know, picking some, a, a textbook and pursuing that is going to be very helpful. Um, as you're currently experiencing Sage's Diagnostics, uh, has a, a wealth of, um, of study material and their, their educational arm of the company is, <clears throat> is amazing at, at uh, really pushing out a lot of content to student learners uh, like residents. There's the YouTube channel, the happy hour, uh, like we're doing now, uh, board reviews. And so I would really recommend kind of going to the website, diving into all the offers, signing up for the happy hour, um, and then the board reviews and, and kind of getting those notifications, the YouTube stuff, just so you kind of get that content there available for you, um, you know, throughout residency. This is kind of a screenshot from the website. And so again, there's a lot of stuff on there uh, that I'd recommend kind of diving into at some point. Pathpresenter.net is a, a website. You can just go to a website, register for a free login, and then there's some content on there that you can access. And it's it's decent. Um, sometimes, you know, you need to make sure you have a good network connection, um, but it's actually driving around these whole slide images, this high resolution content um, of different, you know, diagnoses. You can create your own quizzes, you know, or, or someone at a program can create a quiz. Um, now, there's also a whole separate kind of back-end uh, portion of Path Presenter that uh, Sages uh, uses, for example, I know the residencies here use sometimes as well. Uh, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. You have to pay for that. That's sort of different. Um, but there's, there is some content there that's worth going to, especially when you're practicing virtual dermatopathology and whole slide imaging, moving around a whole slide and, and trying to make a diagnosis which is very different from kind of the standard uh, that we used to have of actually using a you know, glass uh, slide and microscope. Uh, this is the website, pathpresenter.net. Um, uh, so then there's dermpathmd.com. This is a much older website. Um, I, I honestly don't even know if it's still being um, updated. Uh, it, it's these very old PowerPoints, but they, they are decent at sort of just being able to click through and quiz yourself. You have to kind of dig through the website a little bit. I think you click on programs up there in the top tab uh, and you dig through and there's these unknowns and things that you can uh, <clears throat> study from. And, uh, and so just another website of, of this kind of virtual germ path that you can uh, dig into. You can also use the Ackerman algorithms if you find that useful for you. I think every germ resident and path resident studying dermatopathology should probably be at least aware of these algorithms that they exist. This isn't just for germ path fellows, um, and every you know dermatologist and germ path fellow should be aware of who Bernie Ackerman is. Of course, um, he passed away in 2008, but he was really a founding figure in the world of dermatopathology. He was famous for his intelligence, but also his uh, often strong and, and somewhat controversial opinions. Uh, but he really uh, pu pushed. Um, you know, one of the main things he did was he, um, in addition to writing. I've written down here 700 papers and 60 books. Um, he really pushed this method of pattern analysis for inflammatory dermatoses. And so really mostly just talking about inflammatory skin disease. Um, but, th but that's another helpful way to really kind of algorithmically go through um, what you're seeing under the microscope and turning that into a differential diagnosis or even finding the exact diagnosis based on what you're seeing. Um, uh, Dr. Ackerman was also a, a staunch advocate for medical ethics and was an expert witness at over 200 trials, which is kind of crazy. So this is just a picture of one of the um, uh, algorithms that, that are out there, you know, in this textbook. And so you can see, um, you, you come to the microscope, you see uh, a nodular and diffuse dermatitis. So you're seeing inflammatory cells kind of all over the place and big nodules under the microscope or just diffusely kind of top to bottom, left to right. Well, then you pull up this page and then you go from there and you say, are there lymphocytes mostly, or is it mostly neutrophils, or is it mostly eosinophils or histiocytes? And then you go down the algorithm from there. And, and I mean, that can be a, a, a pretty specific way to get to the diagnosis um, very algorithmically. So just another thing that's out there to be at least aware of. And then believe it or not, you know, certainly I would recommend sitting and looking at lots and lots of slides study sets at all the programs, um, you know, going through potpourri, you know, just kind of unknowns. Um, it, that's all very, very helpful. Despite the move to virtual derm path, still certainly want to spend some time looking at the glass. All right, so next I want to go through tissue processing. And um, again, this, you know, especially for a derm resident, this can be a little bit 
exhausting in a sense of, you know, why do I need to know this? And I think it's just helpful to at least do once kind of at this introductory level to have a conceptual framework of what's happening behind the scenes to the tissue biopsy that you put in a formalin jar and you send off to nowhere. And you need to understand how that the person's going to process it, what's going to happen in the lab, how long that takes. I mean, there's there's some important things to, uh, besides just then getting that printout result that says, oh, it's a an island of Um, Because the more you know about it, the more you can understand what to send them, how to send it, you know, proper biopsy technique, uh, limitations, all those sorts of things. So, again, the goal is how does that that little shave biopsy that you, you, you shave off someone, uh, turn into a glass slide, and that then needs to be either read by you in a study scenario or a dermatopathologist. So the biopsy, uh, you know, of course you take, the, and this part doesn't really need to be explained to a, a derm resident, but um, you have this fresh specimen here, and it is a fresh unfixed specimen. Um, only rarely would we send something off uh, in this fresh specimen's state. Um, if it's a tissue culture, you of course don't want it to put in formalin. You'd put in normal saline, or if you're spending for you know, sending for something special like directing the fluorescence. But generally speaking, we want to prevent cell degeneration or drying out, and so that specimen we want to fixate or you know, fix that specimen as soon as possible. And so it must be processed. Um, and there's a whole, you know, different steps that I'll go through here. Um, there's the grossing of the specimen, um, and then there's fixation, dehydration, and bedding. I mean, all these things happen, and, and it takes time. And I'm not going to go through this particular protocol in detail, but the whole point of tissue processing is to create formalin-fixed and then paraffin-embedded tissue so that it can be stored, it won't dry out, it can be stored for a long time and, and can be, you know, slides can be made of it 10 years down the road um, and to do so very uh, reliably uh, with, uh, with tissue that stains well and, and then you can make a diagnosis. So uh, there's, there's reasons for all, all this, but it takes time um, in, in uh, you know, at, at all these different steps. So formalin is of course the fixative of choice and that's the 10% neutral buffered formalin. And, uh, it's important to understand that you actually need, generally speaking, a 10 to 20 fold volume of formalin relative to the tissue. Now we rarely think about this in dermatology because most of our tissue specimens are fairly small. But if you're taking a big, huge back cyst or tissue or something, or maybe you don't know it's a cyst yet, but a big chunk of an excision specimen, and you're trying to cram that into a tiny little, you know, I don't know, five cc or, or really small formalin cup, it's actually not going to really fix well. I mean, you need a decent amount of formalin circling around 10 to 20 full volume to the tissue that you're putting in it. Um, so make sure you're using an appropriately sized cup. Um, and by the way, what if you're sending off for something else, as I already kind of alluded to, you know, if you're sending for direct humofluorescence, you need to use either Michelle's solution or normal saline or recent evidence says honey, apparently. That was kind of new to me recently, but um, we're of course not going to use that. Uh, I guess, unless you're in a pinch. And then the glutaraldehyde is the test answer for, um, you know, electron microscopy. Rarely we do that anymore these days in routine uh, dermatology, dermatopathology, but still important to understand that. And sometimes still may need that. Um, okay, so formalin, you know, there's a lot of benefits to formalin. And, um, you know, of course, we all remember that smell, you know, from uh, med school, uh, from anatomy and physiology lab. Uh, but on a smaller scale for tissue processing, it allows really thin sectioning of tissue um, by, by hardening that tissue. So you can, you know, you take something that's normally squishy, you're going to harden it up with that formalin. You can now make really thin slices of it. Um, it's very stable. It preserves most of the architecture. It prevents the autolysis in, in, uh, of, of cells and also in, it activates infectious agents, most of them. Uh, improves cell avidity for special stains. And so, of course, you know, we use formalin for a lot of things, routine h and &E, immunohistochemistry, and you can even, um, on formalin-fixed tissue, you can do uh, fish, right? So in situ hybridization. There are some drawbacks. It does technically alter the protein structure. And so it's going to affect some tissue antigenicity and, and some forms of, um, and it's going to prevent some forms of cytogenic testing it. You know, nowadays, though, you know, it's more common to be able to get PCR, for example, off of paraffin-fixed, you know, formalin-fixed, paraffin-embedded, sorry, um, tissue. 
Um, but but it can sometimes the formula can affect uh, tissue where you're not going to be getting very reliable uh, the testing uh, from that. It does shrink tissue a little bit um, and distorts things. So even though most architecture preserves, it can shrink things. And so you know if you're trying to get very accurate measurements of tissue distances and whatnot, um, perhaps like a Breslow depth, you know that's not technically the most accurate post fixation. Um, and then some uh, tissue constituents are lost, particularly fat, uh, some carbohydrates, crystals, things like that. Uh, I've already mentioned to you that uh, you need a certain amount of volume, but you also need a certain, a certain amount of time to allow penetration of fixed tips. So if you're on inpatient dermatology and you're doing a biopsy and you want to answer immediately, like within two to three hours, putting in formula is not the right answer because it's gonna, it has to take time. I mean, approximately one millimeter per hour for the first hour, then a millimeter per three hours after that. Now, again, we usually have very small tissue um, uh, specimens, and so can have fairly quick turnaround. Uh, but if you want something answer, you know, same day or super fast, then you need to be pursuing probably a frozen section um, uh, in, in rare circumstances, um, or certainly, you know, ask about rush processing. There's some rush protocols that can be done for skin, but, um, uh, you know, in, in our residency, you can rarely, occasionally, if needed, you know, try to pursue frozen, and that can actually have a pretty good result and get a very quick answer if you're saying, is this pemphis vulgaris versus TEN or something like that. Um, but otherwise, you just need to be understand that it's going to take time for everything to process. Um, and then when the tissue is grossed, it really should be no thicker than two to three millimeters, again, to really um, uh, make, make sure there's enough time for the formalin and the processing to happen in those, those thinner little uh, slices of bread. Uh, all right, so now the fixation. So there's the specimens in the formalin ready for grossing. And I already mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the generous volume of fixative compared to the size of specimens. And then there's this cassette that gets printed uh, uh, that will contain um, the specimen during processing uh, that has the patient information on there. So now grossing, um, this is actually a, a specimen of stomach, but it had been fixed in formalin. Um, and so they're going to make, they're going to actually gross this. So what that means is make gross uh, examination and then also kind of manually processing and cutting and dicing into um, uh, different uh, cassettes because um, you, you don't want to stuff everything in one, in, in one little tiny cassette. You kind of spread it out in a couple different uh, cassettes. Um, and then each of those turn into a different block. Um, that you would cut from to look at to get slides. And so for your run-of-the-mill skin uh, specimen, you know, small skin biopsies, most of that is usually in just one block or one cassette. But if you have an excision, uh, you're going to be bread loafing that and you're going to put each one or maybe a couple of those uh, sections, um, you know, slices of bread that you're, you're pulling off into, um, into individual cassettes that are then labeled. Um, and grossing uh, the, you know, the house, how something is grossed does take some skill. Um, and for example, this is a good example here of, of probably like an acral melanocytic lesion on the left and then just a run the mill melanocytic lesion on the right. And so the grosser, a well taught grosser is, is going to look at this and say, hey, this looks like it's probably something melanocytic and they really want to get an idea of margins if this thing is bad. Um, and so they're going to, um, you know, intentionally bisect it like this, where the pigment, it gets as close to that, to, to the actual margin there as possible. That way, when we're looking at that um, surface face down, that cut surface face down, or in that slide, um, you know, we'll be able to see to the left and to the right, yeah, it gets pretty close to the margin and this thing's bad. And, and so you need to make sure you remove it. And this is just very basic examples, but um, you know, they, they want to kind of give us the best idea of how close it gets to the margin as possible. And uh, trying, they're trying to cut this, especially on a, on a specimen like on the left, they're trying to cut this as straight down as possible. Um, but these are really small pieces of tissue. And so some of these things get cut tangentially or at an angle, or they squish while you're trying to slice it. I mean, I did grossing uh, when I was in fellowship. And, and so, you know, it can be challenging uh, to, to process these tiny little specimens sometimes. Um, for example, anything less than a four millimeter punch biopsy may not actually get bisected. Uh, three millimeter you probably can, but certainly if you're doing a two millimeter punch biopsy, which I typically discourage uh, as you know for, for derm residents, if you're doing a two millimeter punch biopsy, there is probably not going to get bisected because the whole thing's just going to get crushed when you're trying to slice it in half to then put those that, those cut halves down. So that way, when you're making the slides, you're kind of making the slides from the center of the tissue. 
But if you don't cut, bisect something uh, or trisect something, then you're just cutting from the outside of the tissue and, and you may not see um, uh, you know, the most active area. Uh, so typically we wanna try to look from almost the center of the tissue, but if it's too small, you may not be able to do that. All right, so now things are put into these cassettes, as I mentioned, uh, this is definitely not skin. Uh, but 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 sent off to the processor and there's you know putting these cassettes little lids are put on and they're in their clothes. Another brief thing on grossing, um, uh, you know alopecia specimens are often processed differently. There's a lot of different ways to process alopecia or hair specimens. There's what's called the Tyler technique, the Hover technique. Um, you also can just take two punch biopsies, so to one four millimeter, you know from affected area, another you know, or maybe two four meter punches from an affected area, or some people would say, you know, one from the affected, one from the unaffected. Again, a lot of different ways, both clinically and, and uh, pathologically to kind of approach these specimens. I'm not gonna get into de super details here. Uh, when I was in fellowship, we mostly did the Tyler technique when we process it because you get both a vertical and um, transverse sections all in the same cassette or same block, uh, but you need a big enough punch biopsy for that. And there's still limitations to that. Um, so it just depends on where you're, you're training and, and kind of what the um, both the derm and the pathology staff have kind of worked out and prefer. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to, to process hair specimens that is unique to dermatology. All right, so now those cassettes are going to be put in these baskets. They're going to be processed. And so the tissue processor is, here you can see is being loaded with a basket of cassettes um, and uh, a lot of different protocols and things that can be used uh, for that processing. Um, you can see here again, sort of these little baskets um, that go through uh, one of those protocols uh, that almost I uh, showed on the, the first slide. Okay, so now one very, I think very important um, uh, aspect to learn is, is the embedding. Uh, and so this is where you're actually embedding. So it's, the, the tissue has now been processed and it's ready to be embedded and fixed in paraffin so that then you can cut uh, little tiny thin sections and make slides out of it. But in order to embed it, you need to embed it in an orientation that optimizes you know, how it's going to be cut. And you know, how do you just get this floppy piece of tissue to stand up tall and straight how you want it? You, you put in wax and the wax of course can be melted to make it a little bit more pliable or pretty much liquid. And then it can be cooled to kind of harden once you have the tissue embedded in the correct orientation. And so on these, this is an embedder station. And by the way, I would say for really any derm resident, if at all possible, it would be an excellent idea to even just spend 30 minutes or an hour uh, one time going to the path lab, watching the grocers, you know, gross for a few minutes, watching the embedders embed. I, I think you will learn a lot and be a better dermatologist for it because you'll understand what happens to that tissue after it leaves, you know, your, your uh, clinic, your room, um, and just conceptually and kind of 3D, you'll understand what's happening to this tissue. Um, so again, these for embedding, there's these um, little trays, uh, and there's a lot of different sizes there. But the 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 point is, it's almost like this little bowl that you're going to fill with melted uh, paraffin, the wax, and then you're going to keep it on the hot plate. You're going to put the tissue in there, but then you're going to put it on a cool plate, and you're going to let it cool once you have the orientation of the tissue correctly. And then once it's correct, well, then you put in you know, a fridge and the whole thing, you actually put the cassette on top of it that it was already processed in. And it forms one big thing that uh, where the cassette has the paraffin kind of attached to it. And then that is the block. And that is what we then cut thin little sections off of, little ribbons you'll see here in a second to make the slides with. But um, as I keep mentioning, embedding is critical to get the orientation um, correct. So if this was a shave biopsy that has then been bisected straight down the middle, um, and you put it in the block like this where it's flat, this is actually incorrect because we're not really seeing, we're, we're actually going to be cutting then from the, if it's put down like this, um, it'll get flipped technically with a paraffin, but um, you're going to be, uh, if you don't orient this correctly, you're going to be making slides where you're actually looking at the surface of the skin from the bottom up. You're going to be basically looking at the sub-Q level and then the dermis and then the epidermis uh, as you cut through the tissue and make more slides. 
and that's not what we want. We want to look at most skin tissues vertically. We want to look at it um, where we can see the epidermis, dermis, and sub-Q come in one slice of um, you know, bread, if you give a bread loaf, uh, and look at that as a 2D image um, to, to get the best orientation. So usually what you do for most skin specimens after they've been cut, you're actually trying to flip them up on end and this is where the challenge is and keep them, you know, have them stay there while you then embed that and, and fix that in the wax. Um, so again, this is the kind of the critical part of embedding and sort of shows um, of how you kind of have to put a lot of these tissues up on end. So then after that, um, the, you now have formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissue in this paraffin block. And so this is the block that you would pull uh, if, you know, let's say it's 10 years down the road and you want to pull the block to, to you know, make more slides off of a, a case to, for research or something, well, you can go pull the block if they still have it um, and, and uh, look at the, and make, and you make, you know, brand new fresh slides from that tissue, uh, that, that paraffin embedded tissue. So now you have sectioning, and this is where the solid paraffin block is mounted on the tissue holder of a microtome. Uh, because just going back here, that's what this, this block is now ready for uh, the microtome where we're basically making those thin little sections and cutting them. Um, and it's going to be basically finally clamped into the specimen holder. You can see there that black area of the microtome, and then you're going to cut the thin little sections from the face of the block. And um, what happens is the microtome is used to cut a ribbon of about four to five micron thick sections from the paraffin block. And they're kind of rotating this arm and, and kind of, you know, the, the little microtome is going up and down and, and slowly on a, a four to five micron um, increments moving forward and slicing off these very thin, you know, paper thin um, uh, uh, ribbons of the tissue. You can see here this nice little ribbon. Of, this is a different uh, microtome, but basically these thin little ribbons that then are pulled off and um, very, very thin. Uh, and, and the goal of so this, this also is very challenging, good, good to see in person um, because these thin little ribbons can get wrinkled, they can get squished, they can get distorted. And so they're trying to be very delicate with this, uh, even using little paintbrushes sometimes. And then they put it into a water bath, they usually float it on a, a slightly warm water, kind of flattens it out, and then they mount it on um, an actual microscope slide. And that's where they can you know, actually first, it'll just sort of adhere to the slide. So then you get this, and this is kind of the first product that looks similar to what you, you want to be studying or, or looking at uh, for Dermpath. But of course, now you need to stain it. So you have this uh, you know, thin little section of, of tissue on a glass slide, but you can't see anything until you really stain it. Um, and so there's just some examples here. You have more of a H and E stain, and then you have some immunohistochemical stains there. So with the staining, you know most big labs are going to use this huge automated stainer for your routine H and E, um, and th this instrument kind of stains the sections, and then often has this built-in glass cover slipper that kind of puts on the glass cover slip at the end uh, to help preserve them and, um, and and kind of make it ideal, but. But on the right, you can see more of like a small um, uh, little some semi-automatic stainer, uh, kind of like what we have in the Mohs lab in uh, dermatology. Uh, but even some smaller labs may still use this sort of, it's sort of an assembly line, that, that those little white arms kind of move up and down, in and out for, for a certain fixed amount of time through the different stains to create the end result, which is a stain slide. And then of course, there's the cover slipping that happens. So. I know that's a lot and it's kind of in the weeds in the pathology world, but again, I think very important to understand these, what happens to produce these slides that then uh, you would be responsible for learning, at least for the test, but if not for just uh, your education and, and future as a dermatologist or pathologist. Um, and so you produce these slides. So then just a little bit about these stains, um, you know, the, 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 um, the H and E stain or hematoxylin and eosin is the most widely used histologic stain. And there's some reasons for that. It's just very reliable in, in terms of what it stains. And you can see a little chart there with a lot of different colors and, and what it uh, will reliably stain. The hematoxylin, by the way, is, is actually not a dye. It's this extract that's not important, but it it's, uh, stains um, the cell nuclei and, and kind of uh, nucleic material, very dark blue and black, and has very good intranuclear detail. So that's the blue, 
that you see in, on uh, the Ru gene, H gene. And then there's the eosin. And eosin comes from these different dyes and that stains cell cytoplasms and those connective tissue fibers very well. Various shades and intensities of pink, orange, and red. And that's how you get your H and E. And um, again, that's uh, you know very crisp and clear. There's a lot of different special stains out there though. And so a long time ago, someone decided, hey, just for kind of routine pathology, H and E is really the best. Um, even though there's a lot of variations and different things you could do to stain the tissue. And of course, over time, over many, many years, we have learned that some special stains stain things extra special. And so we use them uh, to highlight elastic or uh, mucin or even infectious organisms like the AFB and the fight, um, staining things like, uh, you know, lepromonas leprosy or, or uh, you know, uh, things like that. So, you know, we have special stains and you think of those as more, um, you know, something you'd order to, to, to look for a certain content or, or, or tissue type. But then, but H and E is also technically just a stain, uh, but it, it stains uh, certain things very reliably to provide that classic picture that we think of um, when look, doing dermatopathology. pathology. So then, there's of course immunohistochemistry, and immunohistochemistry has largely replaced, or at least is now a significant role in all of the uh, pathological world. It hasn't necessarily completely replaced special stains, but it's very specific. You're using these immunologic techniques to identify certain cellular antigens that you wouldn't otherwise really see in just your run-of-the-mill H&E section. And, uh, and of course, this technology, if you will, exploits the principle of antibodies binding specifically to antigens in biological tissues. And there's really, there's two different um, enzymes that are typically, that the antibodies conjugated to. It's either gonna be this DAB stuff that's brown or AEC, which is red. That's not super important per se, but it's just, Again, um, provides you that that context that of, of you know why when you look at immunostains, which you are responsible for that. Some are brown, some are red. Uh, it really just kind of depends on the enzyme and, and the uh, that they're using and, and where they're the, they're ordering the, um, that stain from. You know what the company uses. Um, and you can see a picture here, almost like immunofluorescence. You know, immunohistochemistry is using these antibodies, antigens, and then some colored product. Uh, when you um, uh, conjugate with an enzyme, uh, so that the DAB with the, the uh, peroxidase, it then produces reliably that, the, the brown color um, that you then see when you look at an immunohistochemical uh, slide. This is a great example of actually a dual stain slide. Um, so you have the MART1 um, or melon A, it's the same thing, uh, that is a great um, a cytoplasmic stain uh, for melanocytes, uh, very specific. And so that's what all the red is, those are all melanocytes. This is a, a special dual stain that is not only MART1 and melan A, but it's also Key67, which is also known as MIV1. That is a good nuclear stain of proliferation. And so the idea here is if all of the melanocytes are proliferating, that's probably a bad thing. Um, but it really, but, but uh, there's many other things in the skin that might be um, Key67 positive. For example, the green circle on the right is just a run-of-the-mill lymphocyte that is just doing its thing. It's totally benign, uh, but it happens to be key 67 positive because many lymphocytes um, can be. Uh, and so you wouldn't want to mistake that for melanocytes. So this dual stain is very helpful to, to um, isolate that. This is a list of different immunohistochemical stains. So there's stains for everything nowadays, and they just keep adding them on, which is great because uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a valuable tool. So we're almost done. Um, I'm not going to go through this in super detail. I think the main thing, because you really have to do this in person, but what I want to highlight here is that, it, you know, again, even going forward with so much of uh, dermatopathology for at least derm residents and maybe even for path residents, so much virtual focus and virtual testing, you still need to be able to use a microscope and understand some of the basic uh, anatomy of a microscope. And there's still a lot of value in, in, in studying with glass slides. Um, and so kind of knowing how to use the microscope for studying purposes. And then also for some of you, maybe going into dermatopathology fellowship in the future or just reading your own slides. Um, and so you need to know about your microscope and, and how to use it. Um, you know, of course you have the course and fine adjustment, um, but you know, knowing where the condenser is uh, under the stage and knowing how to um, color your, your microscope, for example, 
which I have a slide on that. I'm not going to get into detail of the, the physics of this, but what I like to say for color illumination is it's one simple little thing you can do occasionally for your microscope, kind of align everything in the mirrors and whatever, and it produces a crisper, better image. So why would you not do it? Um, it may make you feel, uh, you know, a little bit nerdy when you do it, but I, I think it's a good idea. And so again, just knowing about some of these things about your microscope um, it can be helpful. And when you're sitting there not understanding why everything is so blurry um, and why you can't study because it's just it, the, the, the picture is, is uh, horrible when you look at the microscope, um, it, it's helpful to, to know how to manipulate the microscope to, to clear everything up. All right, briefly, um, I do want to mention Mohs micrographic surgery here, and I, I think it has a role in this um, talk because, you know, for, for a long, long time, we, uh, and still, of course, now, we, we process standard excisions, wide local excisions, through your standard bread loafing um, method, but it's, it's important con conceptually to understand, um, you know, how that's different uh, um, from Mohs. Uh, bread loafing is, you know, kind of goes to all the same stuff I just discussed, the tissue processing and slicing and making these thin sections and all that sort of stuff. Um, but Mohs is very different. And so especially for a derm resident to understand the differences there is very important. So this is a conventional excision. Um, you know, you have this big Goomba on someone's back and you're going to do an elliptical excision around it and you cut out the whole thing. And in the second uh, picture there, you see, you know, you cut the whole thing out, but you kind of left this tiny little thing there, which you just, you know, you took your standard margins, but maybe it grew outside that a little bit. And so there's still something in the, in the skin in the patient. So then when we do bread loaf sectioning uh, in the lab, you know, we're cutting these big two to three millimeter chunks, these huge slices uh, or you know, the slices of bread in the bread loaf. Um, and then each of those huge, relatively huge chunks are then put into a cassette. And that cassette goes through everything we just talked about. But then we're only actually cutting those little ribbons, right? We're just taking thin little sections, thin little ribbons as a sample from each one of those big, thick pieces of bread or slices of bread. And then those we are turning on end and looking at vertically. And that's what we're going to look at on the microscope. In this case, you would have a through F blocks of tissue. And so that would mean six slides for me to look at. Uh, so six little thin sections um, from this big tumor. And that's all I'm using to, you know, say whether you have clear margins and to, to assess the tumor. And it is still the gold standard and it still works extremely well, but it does have um, some pitfalls as you can see demonstrated here. So it's important to understand this conceptually where, and so again, it's literally like you know, bread loafing and, and we're just looking at a couple little slices of, of the bread. Whereas Mohs um, is kind of this special, you know, we like to say it's a skin sparing surgery because they're just barely cutting around the tumor typically, but it's not just that, it's also how they're cutting out essentially a bowl of tissue that they then, you know, section uh, there in the lab and then they sort of lay it flat uh, when they process it. And then they're able to look at all the margins uh, all at the same time. And, and then they can see typically, oh, we, there's still a little area that's positive. And so then they take just that area out. Uh, again, they take another layer and look at just that area under the microscope. And so it just, it, it allows um, a little bit more margin control. Uh, and I think, you know, you, you could say, well, you know, is Mohs better than excision? Certainly there's pros and cons. The main point I'm trying to get across is it's, it's important, especially for a dermatology resident, to understand conceptually the differences and, and just what they both do, how they're both great, how they both have limitations. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that. This is just another picture kind of showing that same thing that you can review later. Uh, last, last thing is uh, for, for uh, especially a derm residents to understand that there's a lot of guidelines out there in terms of how to proceed with when you get cancer uh, biopsies result. Uh, the NCCN is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, and this particularly looks at oncological guidelines and they have one for melanoma. We'll get much more into this um, later in the year. I bring it up now because there's important dermatopathological uh, aspects to this. There's staging based off of the American Joint Committee on Cancer, the AGCC guidelines that everyone uses for their guidelines, uh, for, for the secondary guidelines. Um, so it's important to understand that so many of these things are connected, um, that, you know, in terms of pathological staging, 
uh, that then connects to clinical staging. And, and so, and that's, and some of this is tied to what you would see under the microscope. So in this case, this is melanoma guidelines on how deep it is. What is the Breslow depth? Is there ulceration? Is there, um, you know, other factors at play? So um, a lot of this, you know, we, we, we learn it for a variety of reasons and, and um, dermatopathology is also connected to staging certainly. And so another important aspect um, that, that they can provide. So I know that's a lot. Um, again, it's really intended to provide a forest view, an introduction, um, and hopefully that was useful um, and a good way to start off um, diving into the world of dramatopathology, which I personally think is a, is a pretty awesome world. Um, but I uh, wish all of you the best in your training and you're always welcome to reach out uh, if you have any questions. And um, that's it. Take care.